welcome to the Arabian Sabbath School panel. This is an opportunity to study God's Word together. We are in the book of Psalms, lesson number 11, and the author of the lesson is Dragoslava Santrek. And she has done a marvelous work in this lesson, and we are just being blessed as we go through these lessons. Each and every one of us, we're learning something, and we're learning from each other. And we hope you have been following along. My name is John Dinsey, and I like to present the family of 3BN that is with us, Sister Gio Morricone. Thank you, Pastor Johnny. On Monday, we look at Pray for the Peace of Jerusalem. Amen. And we have a singer in Israel, Amen. Ryan Day. All right, I have a Tuesday's lesson entitled, Zion, the Home of All Nations. Amen. And we have Jason Bradley with us. Welcome. Thank you. I have Wednesday's lesson, and it's entitled, Safety and Peace of Zion. Mm -hmm. Amen. And we have Professor Daniel Perrin with us. Thank you. I have Thursday's lesson, Immovable Like Mount Zion. Amen. I'm looking forward to each and every one. And I'd like to ask Jason Bradley if you'll please pray for us. Absolutely. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity we have to study your word. And Lord, we just ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit. Guide our thoughts and uh, be with our audience at home. May this be a blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You know, we have all done study into uh, this lesson and we uh, have consented to share our notes with you. We've heard your desire to have them and we are going to share them free for you. But you have to email us and the email you have to use is uh, SSP for Sabbath School Panel, SSP at 3ABN.org, SSP at 3ABN.org. And here's a note for you, what we say during the Sabbath School panel is not necessarily what is 100% in the notes because as we are going, the Lord impresses us with things to share. So it's not a word for word, but it's enough to help you along in your study and we encourage you to ask for the notes for free. Well, we are into the memory text now that is taken from Psalm 84, verse two. It says, my soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. From the New King James Version, I am reading from Saturday's portion, Sabbath portion, Sabbath portion a quote here from the lesson. It says, what makes Zion the source of hope and joy? Mm. Zion, Zion represented God's living presence among his people. As the people of Israel are God's chosen people, Deuteronomy 7, 6, so Zion is God's chosen mountain, Psalm 78, verse 68, Psalm 87, verse 2. God reigns from Zion, Psalm 99, verse 1 and 2, and founded his temple on Zion as well as uh, Psalm 87, verse 1. Thus, Zion is a place of divine blessings and refuge. Zion is often referred to in parallel or even interchangeably with Jerusalem and the sanctuary, the center of God's work of salvation for the ancient world. Moving into Sunday's lesson, we have the title, A Day in Your Courts is Better Than a Thousand. This is taken from Psalms 84, and the portion of the lesson that I am going through is from Psalms 84. I invite you to join us there. And here we have verse one, Psalm 84, verse one, how Lovely, the New King James Version says, how lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. It's interesting to me that in the King James Version, it doesn't use the word lovely, it uses the word how, love, uh, how amiable is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. So because of these different words, it prompted me to look into the Hebrew and then it says that it's a loved, amiable, beloved, and so very interesting. So if you don't know what amiable means, it's a friendly place, a place that is uh, attractive, a place that is uh, a place that is, you'd like, like to be there. So here in essence, we have the psalmist saying that the tabernacle of the Lord is a place that he would like to be in. And so uh, we, need to understand that it's good to go to the house of the Lord. And we should have a desire to be there. There God's people meet together. There God's people join in worship, in singing, 
they hear testimony. So what God has done, it is a time also to hear the preaching of God's word. So it is a good place to be. It's strange to me that uh, so many people stay away from God's house of prayer when, when they go there, they are blessed and they are in the presence of the Lord. So I ask a question. Why did the psalmist long and faint for the courts of the Lord? This is what we find in verse 2. Notice uh, Psalm 84, 2. My soul longs, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. His entire being desired to be in the courts of the Lord. Do you have that longing desire? when the time comes to go to God's house of prayer, to go to God's church, do you have that looking forward to it uh, attitude or is it, oh no, I got to go to church today. Is that, is that your experience? I encourage you to consider that it is a wonderful blessing to be in God's house of prayer. Now, I'd like to bring the question again. Why did the psalmist long and faint for the courts of the Lord? Uh, I'd like to bring to your attention Psalm 1611. This helps me to understand why. Yes. Notice what it says. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. Mm -hmm. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. So, I would even encourage you, sometimes people are discouraged, they say, I don't know, I don't want to go to church, it's boring, different, different attitudes people take. Before you go to God's house of prayer, place yourself in the hands of the Lord. Lord, I want to go to your house of prayer. Bless me while I'm there. Help me to keep my eyes on you. Take the eyes of people. You know, sometimes people go to church and they're watching how people are dressed, how people are acting, and this distracts them. Satan is at work, even in church, to distract people from receiving the blessing that God has for them. And he'll put thoughts in your mind about, hey, remember that you have to do this. Remember that you have to do that. Remember that you haven't done this and you got to pay that. And, oh, wouldn't you want to go fishing tomorrow? And different kinds of things that go into your mind, distractions, distractions. But ask the Lord to help you focus, to be able to perceive the blessing of being in God's house of prayer and to be able to listen and focus in on every blessing the Lord has in store for you. From a devotional called Amazing Grace by Ellen G. White, it's a compilation, page 251. This is what it, it, we, have, we find there. If the eye is single, if it is directed heavenward, the light of heaven will fill the soul and earthly things will appear insignificant and uninviting. The purpose of the heart will be changed and the admonition of Jesus will be heeded. Your thoughts will be fixed upon the great rewards of eternity. All your plans will be made in reference to the future immortal life. Bible religion will be woven into your daily life. So if our eye is single, directed heavenward, all of these blessings follow. So question, do you long to go to heaven? Do you desire to go to heaven? Mm -hmm. Put it in your heart, like Daniel purposed in his heart. Put it in your heart to go to heaven. God has a wonderful place for you there. And so, Psalm 84, verse 3, Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young, even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Do you consider uh, God your King and your God? I hope you do. This is a wonderful psalm, and it is full of blessings. Let's go to verse 4, as time continues and doesn't stop. <laughs> Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you, Selah. And remember that Selah is like a musical rest, a time to consider uh, things. Verse 5 moves us into another aspect. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, yes. whose heart is set on pilgrimage. This is the New King James Version. And in the King James Version, it says, uh, whose heart is set on way, and actually the word means also highway. As you look into the Hebrew, actually the Jewish publication, uh, first release of the English, English language Old Testament in the United States uses the word highway. Very interesting. 
And it could also mean like a raised way to travel upon. And so, in Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 15, uh, notice what it says there. Because my people have forgotten me, they have burned incense to worthless idols, and they have caused themselves to stumble in their ways from the ancient paths, to walk in pathways and not on a highway. Hmm. So you can get off God's, God's highway, God's way, and start walking in evil pathways. Hmm. And so uh, this is uh, Jeremiah lamenting that God's people had drifted off, had gone off into another road instead of following the Lord. Psalm 84, verse 6. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. And uh, I, because of time, I need to move to the next one. <laughs> o Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. This is a psalm, but also a prayer. And notice what it says in Gospel Workers uh, Page 36, page 36. Communion with God imparts to the soul an intimate knowledge of His will. But many who profess, to, profess the faith know not what true conversion is. Mm. They have no experience in communion with the Father through Jesus Christ and have never felt the power of divine grace to sanctify the heart. Have you felt the divine power to sanctify your heart? If you haven't, look for it, search for it. I have asked the Lord for it. It says, praying and sinning, sinning and praying, their lives are full of malice, deceit, envy, jealousy, and self-love. Mm. The prayers of this class are an abomination to God. Wow. Mm. True prayer engages the energies of the soul and affects the life. He who thus pours out his wants before God feels the emptiness of everything else under heaven. Mm. So when you approach God in prayer, don't do these surface prayers. Go deep into your heart. Cry out to the Lord from the, the, the depths of your heart, asking the Lord to be with you, to bless you, to forgive you, and draw you close to Him. Psalm 84, verse 9, O God, behold our shield and look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. Yes, better than a thousand somewhere else is one day in the courts of the Lord. I would rather be a doorkeeper <laughs> in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Mm. Oh, I encourage you to consider the blessing of being in God's house of prayer, in God's presence, because blessings untold await you. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Johnny. We want to be in Zion. Praise the Lord. I love that. I'm Jill Morricone. On Monday, we look at Pray for the Peace of Jerusalem. My psalm is Psalm 122. So if you want to turn there with me, Psalm 122, we have nine verses that we're going to cover and hopefully six takeaways from those nine verses. Psalm 122, of course, is in the fifth book of the Psalms, so that being from Psalm 107 to 150. And it's in the middle of the Song of Ascents. We talked on an earlier program how the pilgrims, they're also known as pilgrim songs, the pilgrims would come back to Jerusalem, which was up on a hill. They would ascend, as it were, up to Jerusalem. If you look at the historical context of Deuteronomy 16, verse 16, we won't look, read it, but in Deuteronomy 16, 16, it says God's people were called three times a year to come to Jerusalem as pilgrims, as it were, coming back to the tabernacle, to the sanctuary. They were called to come back for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is connected, of course, immediately after the Passover. They were called to come back for the Feast of Weeks. In the New Testament, we call that Pentecost in the spring. And they were also called to come back for the Feast of Tabernacles, or known as the Feast of Booths, which would be in the fall. So God's people are coming back as pilgrims, as it were, to Jerusalem and to the tabernacle, to the temple, to the sanctuary. So let's read the Psalm 122. We're going to start in verse 1. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Takeaway number one, joy. 
should characterize the worship of the believer. Pastor Johnny talked about this. There should be joy when we go into God's house. Mm -hmm. Psalm 104 says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Instead, sometimes, do you dread going to church? Do you dread spending time in his presence? It's interesting to me how it's very easy for us to arrive early for a concert, but it's hard for us to make it on time for church. Preach. It's easy to cheer at a baseball game, but it's hard to even say amen in church. Mm. It's easy for us to sit up front when there's a piano recital, but we sit on the back pew and we can hardly make that when it's in church. It's easy to chat with friends and sometimes hard to talk to God. Mm -hmm. It's easy to sit through a two hour movie, but yet a one hour sermon might feel like mm. torture. Do you know what? When God gets a hold of our hearts, when God changes us, we desire to be in his presence. We want to spend time with him, with his word in the morning, time in prayer, time in study, time in fellowship with other believers, and yes, time in church. Verse two, Psalm 122, verse two. Our feet have been standing within your gates O Jerusalem. The New Living Translation puts it this way. And now here we are standing inside your gates, O Jerusalem. Takeaway number two, joy comes when you and I are in Jerusalem. In other words, joy comes in God's presence. They have come home, as it were, pilgrims, climbed up into Jerusalem, gone back to the tabernacle and the temple. They have come home. There is joy in the presence of God. Pastor Johnny read this Psalm. I love it. I'm going to repeat it again. Psalm 16, 11. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Joy comes in God's presence. Let's read verses three and four. We're in Psalm 122, three and four. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together, where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to the testimony of Israel. What is the testimony of Israel? Numbers one, verse 50 says, you shall appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of the testimony. Oh, they're coming to Jerusalem and specifically they're coming to the sanctuary. They're coming to the temple, spending that time with God. Takeaway number three, God's people, you and I, are called to worship together. They come from all the tribes. They ascend up the hill. They come to the testimony of Israel or to the tabernacle, to the sanctuary. We're called to worship him in his house, his church. There is unity when we come together in one accord. Remember when Pentecost took place in Acts chapter two and the Holy Spirit is poured out with abundance. What happened before that time? In Acts chapter one, they were in the upper room. They were in one accord in one place, praying unitedly together during that time from the ascension of Jesus to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. There is unity when we come in one accord and we worship together. Let's read verse five, Psalm 122, verse five. For thrones are set there for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Now this is interesting. The judicial system was there in Jerusalem historically. You see in 2 Samuel 8, 15, that David reigned over all of Israel and David administered the justice and judgment to all his people. So the pilgrimage would even be a time that the people from surrounding communities could come to seek justice in Jerusalem. They're set there for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Of course, we can always look forward to the coming investigative judgment. At that time, it was the coming investigative judgment that we see in Daniel chapter seven. Takeaway number four. This one's an interesting one to me. Worship is connected with administering justice. Now the pilgrims, they came back for worship here in Psalm 122, they came to the tabernacle and it talks about the justice that takes place there. And you say, wait a minute, how can that be connected? James 1 verse 27, 
pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit the orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. You see, if we are true Christians, you and I will reach out and help those who are in need and seek to right those wrongs that exist. Let's read the last three verses. We're in Psalm 122, six through nine. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. This is the title of my lesson. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls, prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brethren and companions, I will now say, peace be within you. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. It's very interesting. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. How can Jerusalem have peace? How can the church have peace? How can you and I have peace? Takeaway number five, we need to choose to live in peace with God and with each other. But I would submit to you, the only way we have peace with each other is when first we restore our vertical connection with God and we have peace with God. Remember several quarters ago, we studied Ephesians, the book of Ephesians. And in Ephesians chapter two, verses one through 10, we have this incredible, oh, I love these verses, by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So Ephesians two, one through 10, talks about we were dead in trespasses and sins, but God got a hold of us through the power of his Holy Spirit. We submitted our lives to him and he changed us. That that's that vertical restoration of our walk with God. The second half of Ephesians 2 verses 11 through 22 is our horizontal reconciliation with each other as brothers and sisters. You see, we can't really reconcile with each other. We can't ask for forgiveness or come together until we're first reconciled with God. So the peace in Jerusalem, it has to begin first with me. It begins first with my relationship with God, seeking to renew and restore that, then seeking to love my brothers and sisters. Our final takeaway, number six, pray for unity with other believers. If we're called to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, you and I are called to pray for unity in the church and unity as brothers and sisters. Jesus' prayer in John 17, right before he went to the cross, John 17, verse 20, he says, I don't just pray for these alone, meaning the disciples who were there with him at that time, but I also pray for those who will believe in me through your word. In other words, he's looking down the stream of time to you and I today in the last days, the closing moments of this world's history. And he prayed for us, verse 21, that they all may be one, you and I. You as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. You see, unity in the church, unity as a body, exemplifies who we belong to. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. It exemplifies whose we are. So seek to come together and live in unity. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, it's been a blessing so far, and I hope you stay by because we were going to continue in a moment. We'll be back in a moment. Ever wish you could study more deeply along with the three ABN Sabbath School panel members? Well, now you can. Just send an email request to ssp at 3abn.org, and we'll email you the Sabbath School panelist notes on a weekly basis to enhance your own study of God's Word. That address again is ssp at 3abn.org. We'd love to send you their notes just as they've prepared them. Thank you for watching, and thank you for being part of our 3ABN Sabbath School panel family. Welcome back, and we're ready to move into Tuesday's portion with Evangelist Ryan Day. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Denzi and Ms. Jill Morricone. I am Ryan Day. I have Tuesday's lesson entitled, Zion, the home of all nations. And uh, that is exactly the best, uh, ch best title you could come up with on this particular lesson, because that is literally what the content is revealing, is that every single person in the Lord, no matter what nation you're from, no matter where you're from on the planet, no matter what race you are, you are God's. And of course, you have a natural right to inherit 
God's kingdom. And so uh, we're going to jump right into Psalm 87, which is what this, uh, this lesson, uh, the content of this lesson is foundationed on. Psalm 87, and I'm going to begin right in verse 1 and 2. And the, the lesson just asks the question, what makes Zion such an esteemed place? Verses 1 and 2 brings that out. It says, his foundation is in the holy mountains. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. This is God's special place. This is God's special city. These are God's special people. And he esteems this above anything else. But yet he wants all to be a part of that plan. He wants, all, wants this place to be a dwelling place for all peoples who will accept him. The lesson brings out Psalm 87 is a hymn celebrating Zion as God's specially chosen and beloved city. The foundation of God's temple is on Mount Zion. At the end of the time, Zion will rise up above all mountains, signifying the Lord's sovereign supremacy over the whole world. Psalm 87 refers to Zion as mountains to highlight its majesty. God loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwelling the dwellings of Jacob, expressing the superiority of Zion over other places in Israel that were special gathering places of God's people in the past, such as Shiloh and Bethel. But of course, it goes on to say, thus, the psalm affirms that true worship of God is in his chosen place mm -hmm. and in his prescribed way. And uh, we go on and read the rest of these verses in Psalm uh, 87. And we go through and read verses 3 through 7. And we start to get an understanding of just how special this place is and what God's intended plan is for this special place. Uh, Zion, uh, let's see, we're going to go to Psalm 87, verse 3. It says, Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God, Selah. I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon, notice, to those who know me. Okay, this is obviously within the context of those who have surrendered to them, those who have given their life to him, those who now know God uh, personally. And he goes on to say, Behold, O Philistia and Tyre with Ethiopia, this one was born there. Uh oh, notice what he's doing here. Mm -hmm. And of Zion, it will be said, This one and that one were born in her. And the Most High himself shall establish her. The Lord will record, notice this, when he registers the people. God's going to take the census roll. He's going to know exactly who belongs there. And it says, This one was also born there. Selah. And of course, verse 7, it says, Both the singers and the players on instruments will say, All my springs are in you. So you can just sense God's heart as He is looking forward to the time when all of His people yes. who have surrendered their life to, the, to Him, all of those people who know Him personally will dwell in this special place that, called, that He calls Zion. Of course, we're talking about that holy city as we will continue through the study. We might get to some texts that describe that. The lesson brings out that the glory of Zion draws all nations to God. And so the borders of God's kingdom are extended to include the whole world. Notice that God does not treat the other nations as second level citizens, even if Zion is portrayed as a spiritual birthplace of all peoples who accept the Lord as their Savior. And the, and it, the lesson brings out a couple of texts, and I want to read these texts because they're special texts, and I really, really love these biblical promises that we have. And a couple of them is going to come from Romans, uh, one from Galatians, and of course one from Colossians as well. But we're going to Romans chapter 3. And uh, these verses are very, very per, uh, popular verses for ones that we've heard many times. But we're in Romans chapter 3. We're going to read verses 21 and 22. Notice what the Bible says. It says, But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, notice, through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all. All who believe, for there is no difference. And I love that. I love the fact that God is not excluding His special plan to just a certain group of people or a certain few races. I know some people will go back and read that New Testament and they think that because that Bible story, from, it seems from Genesis all the way through, uh, through the end of the Old Testament there, especially all the way through uh, to the book of Acts, it seems that it's highly, highly saturated just with Israel as if God only cares for Israel. 
but you will see tucked behind special chapters and verses all even throughout the Old Testament where God is saying, you know, his whole plan from the beginning was to use Israel as a beacon of light yeah. to the rest of the world in hopes that his plan would establish a longing and a yearning and a drawing of all of the other nations to this light and to God's salvation. Romans chapter 10 verses 12 and 13 also brings this out as well. Romans 10 verse 12 and 13, it says, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, meaning Jew and non-Jew or Jew and Gentile. It says, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call up on him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So this is further solidifying that it's God's plan for everyone, not just a few select people, but anyone who will call upon him and make him Lord of their life. Galatians 3, 28 and 29. This is one of my favorites. I love these verses. Yeah. Galatians 3, 28 and 29. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That same beautiful promise that God gave Abraham. And because Abraham was a man of faith, if we are a people of faith, we are grafted and brought into that beautiful family of God, no matter where we're from and no matter what race we find ourselves in. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 11 also brings out this beautiful promise. I'm only establishing this because, again, many people can go to one, one text or another text and, and it, we want to show that God has made this very clear in His Word that each and every one of us can find ourselves in that beautiful city of Zion if only we put our trust in Him. Colossians chapter 3 in verse 11, it says, Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, uh, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all in all. I love that. If you will simply surrender yourself to Him. The Psalms' portrayal of the prosperity of Zion is reminiscent of Daniel's vision that we see there of God's kingdom becoming an enormous mountain and filling the whole earth. So we go to Daniel and we see this beautiful promise as well, even in the prophetic chapters of Daniel as well. So Daniel chapter 2, and I'm going to read a few select verses here. Daniel chapter 2, we'll start with verse 34. It says, you watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Now we'll go uh, to the latter part of verse 35. It says, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to another or to, to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. And so by the way, those last uh, verses that I read there, I skipped from verse 35 to verse 44. And of course, uh, if you read on into verse 45 at the end of the chapter there, it's talking about that vision that Daniel saw of the stone that came and struck the image at its feet. And we know that those four kingdoms, you know, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, Rome divides, were in that divided state today, but the, the stone comes and unlike the previous worldly empires before it, it fills the whole earth and becomes a great eternal kingdom. This is the prophetic promise we have. God's word is, is, has made it very clear. God's promises never fail. And he says, you know what? Go read the back of the book. God wins. God wins. His people win. His city will win. The question is, are you going to be in that city? Are you going to be a part of those people? Are you going to place your trust in Him and be able to call Zion your home? Uh, it's really your choice. God is not holding anything back. He's not made it difficult. He's not made it hard. He has paid the price for you. And He simply says, will you come? Will you be my people? Will you dwell with me for all eternity? It's your choice. And I love the promise that we have in Revelation chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. Also within the context of this great Zion city, New Jerusalem conversation. It says in Revelation 3, verses 11 and 12, Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in my temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. So when you have a new relationship in Christ, you will have a new name in Christ. You will have a new home in Christ and with Christ. That's the promise. And so I go back to the top of this lesson study here. Zion, the home of all nations. Will you be a part of it? 
Mm -hmm. amen. amen amen thank you my brother there's victory in Christ amen? Mm -hmm. amen amen I have Wednesday's lesson and it's titled safety and peace of Zion I want to share this fun fact with you I cannot sing well to save my life if you give me a song in the key of a I'll be in the key of F if you put it in D I'll be in G it doesn't matter what key you put it in I cannot sing but I have great appreciation for a wonderful song, a well-written song, but there's something different about a song that someone sings from a place of pain, from overcoming, yeah. from singing with a purpose. Now, I know that probably maybe in your church, you have seen people that you know went up to sing and they were exceptional. They were really talented, but they lacked the anointing. And you probably thought they were trying out for American Idol rather than worshiping our Lord and Savior. Psalm 46 is a beautifully written and I mean, it's a beautifully written psalm there, beautifully written song. And when I read that chapter, I could tell that the sons of Korah witnessed God's goodness and they heard stories of his amazing grace. And Psalm 46, chapter one through seven gives us a really poetic picture of peace in the midst of the storm. So let's look at verses one through seven of Psalm uh, chapter 46. God is our refuge and strength, mm -hmm. a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, Selah. Mm -hmm. There is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High, God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Okay, let's look at the lesson for the breakdown of what we just read. And I quote, the psalm gives a vivid description of the world in turmoil, and it is portrayed with the images of natural disasters of unprecedented intensity. The image of disturbed waters often depicts the rebellious nations and various problems that the wicked cause in the world, end quote. Now let's look at Psalm chapter 93, verses three and four. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods have lift up their waves. Verse four, the Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, than the mighty waves of the sea. Now, all right, let's look at Psalm chapter 124, verses two through five. And this part right here, this is a, this is a sermon in and of itself. Mm -hmm. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when men rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us alive. Mm -hmm. When their wrath was kindled against us, mm -hmm. then the waters would have overwhelmed us. The stream would have gone over our soul. Then the swollen waters would have gone over our soul. Have you had that experience before? I'm speaking of that if I had not been if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when? That experience. If it had not been the Lord who was on your side when you were running late to work, 10 minutes late to work, and there was a 10 car pile up on your exact route to work, but you avoided it. If it had not been the Lord who was on your side when doctors said you were one of the sickest people in the hospital, yet he restored you to life that experience. If it had not been the Lord on your side when you were staring down the barrel at a potential maximum prison sentence of 15 years, but he blessed you with a second chance opportunity for his honor and glory, that experience. What is your story? Finish that sentence. If it were not for the Lord. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't only trust God in the good times, but we need to trust him in the worst of times. We need to trust him in times of trouble. We need to trust him in moments of despair. We need to trust him 
at all times. Let's look at Psalm chapter 62, verse 7 and 8. Psalm 62, verses 7 and 8. In God is my salvation and my glory, mm -hmm. the rock of my strength, and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Hmm. Now let's look at Psalm 46, verses 2 and 3. Therefore, we will not fear. I love that. We don't have a need to fear. Yeah. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. Selah. Now, Psalm chapter 46, verse 4. Watch this. There is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. Even though there's chaos, even though there's danger, even though we face the storms of life, we have no need to be fearful because God is faithful. Amen. Right here, or right there in verse 4, we see the antidote for strife. In John chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Peace is not the absence of tribulation, but it's manifested in the midst of it. Now, there are many stories of people uh, in the Bible who have overcome difficult situations. And one of my favorite stories is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were faced with their fiery trial. God was their refuge and strength, mm -hmm. a very present help in trouble. In fact, let's look at that. Daniel chapter 3, verses 14 to 18. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Now, I want us to pause right there. Uh, because there's a point we need to grab. The music that we listen to leads us either to God's altar or to the enemy's altar. There's strength in God, but there's weakness in the enemy. Now, when we look at the songs contained in the book of Psalms, especially Psalm 46, beautiful, beautiful song, we know that we're being led to God's altar. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, of course, didn't bow down. We know how the story goes. They got cast into the fiery furnace. The king heated it up seven times hotter. But Jesus came down and he stood with them in the midst of their trial. That's right. And he was there with them. And Jesus will come stand with you in the midst of your fiery trial as well. So, in the essence of time, how do we learn to have peace and to trust God in the midst of the storm? Well, let's look at a couple of verses. S stay focused. That's number one. We have to stay focused. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. We need to stay prayerful. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Third, we need to stay faithful. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 24 says, Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. And we need to stay still. Psalm chapter 46, verse 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. There is peace in God's presence. And that's where we need to be, is in the presence of God. 
And with that, I pass it on to you, Dan. Amen. Thank you very much. Peace in God's presence, and so that's where we should stay. I'm Daniel Perrin, and I have Thursday's lesson, Immovable Like Mount Zion. And the lesson takes us to Psalm 125, just the first two verses. <laughs> Psalm 125, also one of these songs of ascent up to Jerusalem. Verse 1 and 2 says this, Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, mm -hmm. which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forevermore. Now, from my little experience many years ago doing rock climbing, I can tell you this. You are only as secure as the rock that you have attached yourself to. Mm -hmm. If the rock falls, you are going to fall. So how immovable is the rock of Zion? I grew up in the Northwest, lived there most of my life, and I've climbed up to the rim of the crater of Mount St. Helens. From there, you can see Mount Hood, Mount Rainier, Mount Adams. But you look down into that crater and you realize that on May 18, 1980, what felt like half the mountain exploded into the atmosphere or slid into Spirit Lake, and you realize that a mountain of rocks cannot be trusted to not move. It can move. But we're not talking about just any mountain here. This is Mount Zion. Can Mount Zion move? What is Mount Zion? Well, physically speaking, it's not that big a deal. You know, the elevation is 2,474 feet. There's a 7,000 foot tall mountain in Israel. Mount St. Helens is 8,000 plus feet, even after a large portion of it was blown away. So the first reference to Mount Zion in the Bible is in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. And uh, it's the Jebusites who control the territory and they think it's impregnable. And yet God, verse 7, nevertheless, David, through God's power, took the stronghold of Zion. That is the city of David. And it became the capital city of Jerusalem. And then that's where the sanctuary, which points forward to Jesus, was. All right, so that's, that's where we first encounter it. Psalm 132, verse 13 says, the Lord has chosen Zion. He chose it. He, he, he picked it out. He could have picked somewhere else. He picked this. Psalm 1911 and many other texts say that God dwells in Zion. But Zion's more than just a place. Mm -hmm. Zion on earth represents God's eternal home, and for us, it represents the promise that that will also be our home. We're not talking just about Jerusalem or Zion on earth here, and this is why God actually allowed Jerusalem, Mount Zion, to be destroyed and his people to be scattered because these were people who had let go of God's promises because the, the rocks there on earth, the mountain on earth was not the promise. And Abraham knew this. He, this is why Hebrews 11:10 says he's looking for a city with foundations whose builder was God. See, Mount Zion there in, Jer in Israel was not endowed at creation with any special strength or power. There was nothing in it there, but it was that God had chosen it. The soil of the Middle East, the Mediterranean area, there's nothing powerful or magical in that dirt, but it's God's choice. And that's the key here. What has God chosen for us? Because God is the one who's durable. And so the immovable Zion tells us that God is trustworthy. For most of you who are watching, listening right now, you've already made a decision to trust in God. But for some of you, perhaps you're listening right now and you've not made that decision. You say, can I really put my trust in God? I mean, that sounds like a lot of religious talk, religious language. I'm not gonna ask you to put your trust in God simply because I'm gonna give a little talk here. I want you to think about it putting your trust in God. And I'm not gonna give you a bunch of Bible texts right now that tell you to trust the Bible because the Bible tells you to. But I'm inviting you to think about it. And I'm not gonna clear up every objection you might have or you might have heard in the next few minutes, but just listen. In the Bible, God invites you to test him mm -hmm. out. That's right. God is not telling you to follow blindly. He's inviting you to put him to the test. And here's just two Bible texts I'm going to share. Malachi 3.10 says, try me in this. Mm -hmm. God says, put me to the test. 
In Psalm 34, verse 8, taste and see. I'm not asking you, says God, to, to make a decision without being able to test things out. We've all perhaps been duped by somebody sometime who convinces us to buy something without really testing it out. And we realize they've sold us a bill of goods. It's not good. All right. But that's not what God is talking about here. You're invited. If you were in an honest, you know, true in heart, uh, good faith search to look it out, look it up, look at the Bible. The whole Bible is on record for you, as are the lives of Christians in the past. And you'll see in some of those lives, some of them lived up to the truth and some did not. Even the difficult things to understand here in the word of God, the stuff that raises questions, it's not hidden from you. God is saying, I'm putting it all out there. Take a look at everything. I'm not hiding anything from you. The Bible is open to you for comparison with the Christian, with the historic record to see, is this stuff made up there? And as time goes on, here's what we find. God's word continues to be confirmed time and again. Listen to how God says it in Isaiah 1, 18. Come now. Now, let us reason together, says the Lord. God says, I want you to think, think it out. You're not having blind faith here. Second thing I would say, look at the scriptures. And when you do, you're going to see something. For anyone who's on an honest search and willing to test the scriptures out, not just read a few parts here and there to, to find stuff to argue with or criticize, you're going to discover there is a complexity and depth that, that goes beyond something any human mind can create. You can always criticize something way out from a distance, but when you bring it up close and you begin to analyze and evaluate the details we see in the Word of God, there is a depth. God's mind is on display and it is far deeper than anything any human author could write to create a win a Pulitzer Prize somewhere. Number three, along this line, I want you to recognize, I want to I share with you that the Bible has predictive prophecy. That means something, all right? And you can test this stuff out. You are not going to find this in any other book. Complex, specific, multi-layered, long-term, improbable, predictive prophecy. You're not going to find that in any other religious book. And you find it in the Bible, totally on display saying, test it out, look at it. And you don't have to take our word for it. Take, take a look yourself into what God's word says. But here's the point of the prophecy. Prophecies point somewhere. You can see as you look around, the world is changing. And it is not going back to the way it was. It's moving on somewhere. And prophecy in the past points to prophecies that are going to be fulfilled in the future. Prophecy has a conclusion. And even if you close your eyes to it and say, I don't want to investigate, I don't want to see it, it's going to happen. And you have to, you should. I encourage you and urge you, take a look and see what God's word says. Lines are being drawn in this world. There are sides that are that are taken here, that are being taken taken and do you really want to make a decision of the magnitude of trusting in in God whether or not you should based on simply some ideas that you've heard in the past some criticisms or objections or some thoughts you had in your head I invite you to investigate now we've talked about prophecy here on this network all sorts, all sorts of times, all sorts of presentations. Give us a call here. Ask us and we'll send you some resources so you can look into it yourself and evaluate on your own. But why trust in God? I want you to look at the big picture of your own life. And briefly, just two ways here to look at the big picture of your own life. First, you've got a sense of right and wrong. You know it. You, you look at the news and, and some crime is reported and you say, that's wrong. How, how did you get that? Where do we get that idea of right and wrong? And we know that when we look in ourselves, each one of us, we have the person that we are and the person that we ought to be. We sense the gap and there's a guilt and there's an emptiness. And that's just an invitation to you to say, am I willing to look at this promise here, this statement that there is something that deals with that guilt, that emptiness that says there's something behind it. There is a moral lawgiver that you've sensed. Don't, don't turn away from this and just say, no, I don't want to look into it. Can we really trust in God? There's an invitation to you to say, evaluate, look into it, experiment with it. And then second, with looking in yourselves, you're going to agree on this rule that we all agree on, mortality. Everybody before us in the past 2,000 years has died. 
and you are not going to be any different. I'm not going to be any different. Is there more to this universe, more to this world, something else beyond just dying life forms? Is there something else we can put our trust in? And I believe there is, but you've got to make the decision on your own. God's character is love, which means he's not going to force you. He's going to invite you. How can you move an immovable mountain? You drive away from it and it will get smaller and smaller in your rear view mirror. But God's inviting you right now to make the choice to say, put your trust in me, evaluate, taste and see that the Lord is good. I'm inviting you and I'll keep on inviting. Take a look at what God has said. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. I want to remind you that you can get the notes from our presenters at SSP, send an email, ssp at 3abn.org, ssp at 3abn.org. We have time now for a final comment from each one of you. Thank you, Pastor Johnny. Mine was pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I'm reminded of Psalm 133. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren and sisters to dwell together in unity. And as we seek for that peace with God and with each other, let it begin with me. Amen. No matter where you are, what background, what race you come from, if you are in Christ, you are His. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 and 29. I just want to read it one more time. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Amen. Amen. You know, we all have a song that grabs a hold of us, and hopefully Psalm chapter 46 is your song. There's peace in the presence of God. If you're that person right now who you're watching, but you've not made a decision to put your trust in Christ, then I encourage you to do that because think about what Ryan said, Mount Zion, God's eternal Zion is for all of us. There's room for everybody, room for you. And I don't want, God doesn't want anybody excluded. But then there are those of you who you've already put your trust in God. Guess what? You've got that invitation once again. It wasn't something we did just once long ago. We appeal to you again. God appeals to you through his word. Put your trust in me. Amen, amen. Thank you to each one of you. And we are coming to the end of lesson number 11. I'd like to share with you Psalm 84, verse 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. Do you need grace and glory? The Lord is willing to give that to you. Not only that, it continues. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Mm -hmm. We invite you to consider everything you have heard and also so that you may have a desire to long for God in Zion. And you will be blessed and you will be encouraged to know that you can be in the presence of the Lord and have the peace that passes all understanding. Join us next week, lesson number 12, Worship That Never Ends. Thank you.